Looks like we got another letter from Paul this week. This guy just won't quit, Harry. <laughs> well, let's see what he has for us this week. Dear Nestville Mennonite Church, I want to encourage each of you this morning to welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with, even when it seems that they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who has been around for a while might well be convinced that he can eat anything on the table, while another, with a different background, might assume all Christians should be vegetarians and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing what the other ate or didn't eat? God, after all, invited them both to the table. Do you have any business crossing off people the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. Or say, one person thinks that some days should be set aside as holy, and another thinks that each day is pretty much like any other. There are good reasons either way, so each person is free to follow the convictions of conscience. What's important in all this is that if you keep a holy day, keep it for God's sake. If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God, and thank God for prime rib. If you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God, and thank God for broccoli. None of us are permitted to insist on our own way in these matters. It's God we are answerable to, all the way from life to death and everything in between, not each other. That's why Jesus lived and died and then lived again, so that he could be our master across the entire range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. So where does that leave you when you criticize a brother? And where does that leave you when you condescend to a sister? I'd say it leaves you looking pretty silly, or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment facing God. Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there one bit. Read it for yourself in scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will test the honest truth that I and only I am God. So tend to your knitting. You've got your hands full just taking care of your own life before God. Your fellow servant in Christ, Paul. Thank you very much, Gary. And uh, you are right. Paul seems to go on and on and on about these things, whether prime rib or broccoli. Love that. You know, there are uh, many things uh, that we as a culture are disputing in these days. And uh, that's kind of the terminology that, that Paul uses. Um, the, the scripture reading was from the message, but uh, the, the NIV says that we are to ac- accept one another and stop quarreling about disputable matters. And uh, there are a lot of disputable matters, aren't there? in our days. Uh, It is an election year, after all, right? And so the mudslinging has been going on for a while, and I'm afraid, from what I understand, it's going to continue to go on for a while. Taxes, health care, social security, and well, a whole lot of other disputable matters are being discussed, and they are being debated, and they are being reported on by news agencies and by nighttime and by daytime talk show hosts and probably by the common folks like us as well. And sometimes, if not often, those discussions turn into quarreling, even out and out fighting. Now, we love it when this happens on TV, right? or in the town hall. Nothing better than watching a a reality show where everybody is quarreling and fighting about disputable matters. But in real life, when it happens, when it happens in our lives and we begin to quarrel or see quarreling about disputable matters, it can quickly result in divisions 
and in separations. I know uh, of a married couple, one who is a Republican and one who is a Democrat, who in election year sleep in separate beds and eat at separate tables. We laugh at that, but I know of churches that do that same kind of thing as well over political matters and over spiritual matters and ideals and agendas. And churches like that are like the churches that Paul is writing to in Rome. And you probably know of churches like that as well today. Or at least maybe you knew of churches like that as well today if they still remain in existence. Why do I say that? Because quarreling over disputable matters, as Paul describes it, will destroy the church, or really any group of people, faster than any one thing that I know of. Now, what Paul means by disputable is that there are some matters of faith in which there are more than one right answer. Or to be clearer, there are really no one right answers. And it is up to the individual on their own experience, based on their stage of faith, based on their consequence or their conscience to decide what they will and what they will not do. Now, a political example would be to say that, and I know this is risky, that there is probably one or more ways, there are probably more than one ways to fix our economic situation. There are probably more than one ways to fix our economic situation. But that is the truth. And the recognition of that makes it possible for all to move forward together. The alternative to decide that there is only one right way of doing something usually leads us to division. I have seen that happen over and over again in churches. One group of people pick an issue, an idea, or an agenda and believe it to be completely right and good and just. Often they say, this is the word of God. Another group has another slightly different, maybe very different point of view on the very same word of God and the quarreling and the arguing and the gossiping and the backstabbing begin. And before anyone knows it, Satan has won. The church either divides or closes its doors because so many people have left in the midst of all the pettiness. Because, as you well know, really nobody likes to be around the quarreling and the gossiping unless they are participating in the quarreling and the gossiping. Paul saw that quarreling over things not pertaining to salvation was starting in the church at Rome. And he knew that it had to stop or else it would destroy God's work there. So he gives this instruction in Romans 14. And I think there is just as much that the church needs to hear from Paul today as the church did in Rome at the time that Paul wrote this. So Paul writes this to avoid the demise of the church in Rome. And he offers a few strategies. He believed that everyone in the church wanted the same thing. He believed that they all wanted to love the Lord their God with all their heart and all their strength and to follow Jesus faithfully. I believe the same thing about the church today. He also believed that the church believed that they had been called by God to help others love God and follow Jesus. Jesus faithfully. And I think that that is something that probably everyone in this room as well desires. They just disagreed about what that would actually look like, 
about how that would actually be lived out in the church and in the world. And that is what was causing all the quarreling. You see, some of the community, faith, community of faith saw the good deals on the meat that had been sacrificed to idols in the marketplace where they shopped every day. And because they believed that they were free in Christ and that those gods that they were sacrificing the meat to didn't exist, they felt perfectly fine about joining in on the good deals, buying the food, and serving it at their tables. After, of course, praying and giving thanks to God, the true God, for the meat. Maybe that's how we began to pray for our meals as Christians, giving thanks to God for what had been placed graciously before us. Now, others in the community of faith thought that this was terrible and a compromise of their commitment to Jesus. They were focused on being pure like God and Jesus was. And so as a testimony to that, they decided not to eat the meat that was sacrificed to other gods. After all, God was pretty clear about not worshiping idols and other gods. I mean, after all, if they ate that meat sacrificed to other gods, what would other people think? What kind of witness would they be to Jesus and their God? Both of these, friends, are very good, very valid, and very biblical rationales for behaving the way they behaved. No one can really argue with either side as being the wrong, only right answer. I'd like to get some audience participation here, some congregational participation here, if we might. So I'd like to invite you to join with me in a little exercise. It's a participatory exercise, all right? So here's what, what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to think about your favorite food. Think about your favorite food. Now, not just that you like chicken or beef or broccoli. Gary, we know where you land. You know, not, not that kind, but be specific, really specific about the, the prepared meal that you really love, okay? Think about that right now and get that in your mind because I'm going to ask you to share it here in a minute, okay? You got it? All right. You got it? You know what you're going to say? All right. Well, either way, we're going to move on. Now, turn to the person next to you, all right, and tell them specifically what you consider to be the bestest most yummiest dish in the world. All right? Tell them what is the best, most yummiest dish in the world according to you. All right? You have a minute. And what I'd like for you to do is after you shared it, raise your hand so I know you're done. Be specific. When you're done, raise your hand. Lauren, you're done, I guess, so raise your hand. Carol, you look done. Raise your hand when you're done so I know what to do. I can move on. I need everybody to raise their hand or else we can't move on when you're done. Make sure you're shared. Is everybody pretty much done? Yeah, everybody got to share? All right. Now. I want you to turn to your partner again, and I want you to say this. You can use your own words, but say this. We disagree. Hold on. We disagree, but I still love you and accept you and want you to be part of this church. Okay, something like that. We disagree, but I still love you. I want, to be, want you to be part of this church. Sandy, doesn't that feel good? Much better. Now you know.
A lot of fun, of course. Accept one another. And stop quarreling over whether chicken piccata or lasagna is the best meal in the world. It doesn't pertain to salvation. You get to choose. You get to eat what you want. You get to eat what you like. And you know what? We can still fellowship. We can still eat together. This doesn't have to be such a big issue. We can continue to serve the Lord. And you know, that's what Paul wanted the church to say to each other over these slightly more weighty issues. But they weren't. And there were not only disputes about the food, as we see in this scripture, but the faith community also had disputes and discussions about whether or not they needed to worship on a certain day, whether they needed to celebrate cultural or religious festivals. They had conversations about circumcision. Ouch. Whether or not it was okay to drink wine or not, and on and on and on. And you know what? We continue, as you well know, to have these same kind of conversations in the church today. And, and to be clear, just so you know, discussions are good. They're important. We need to discuss these kinds of things. But when discussion turns to quarreling, to gossiping, and to division, that is, according to the Bible, sin. It is a scheme of the devil and a tactic that Satan uses against us to destroy the work of God. At the very least, if you don't consider it to be a sin, then you can at least recognize that quarreling over disputable, silly matters doesn't make for the funnest party. So we must discuss things, discuss things, but we can never allow them to divide us. Now, some of you will say that this teaching of Paul cannot be applied to all things. That there are some things of faith that are of eternal significance that we cannot compromise on. And of course, there are. Of course you're right about that. And I imagine that there was this kind of objection raised even to Paul himself when he wrote this letter. But those things, those things that really are, are central and per, that we cannot compromise, they are the big picture things, friends, like Jesus is Lord. And frankly, according to Scripture, even if people disagree about that, we are still called to love the other and to love them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have to be in relationship with them to do that. I could share a dozen stories about how this kind of thing can destroy a church. But I prefer to share one that displays how a group of people decided to listen to Paul and to choose a better way, which ended in the church growing as opposed to diminishing. I, I know of a, of a couple who entered into a newly formed Mennonite church. And as they walked into the Mennonite church, they weren't from Mennonite background. They began to notice something odd and strange in the congregation. Some of the ladies in the congregation had these doilies on their head. And um, they were dressed rather plainly. They didn't wear makeup or jewelry. And then sitting right next to them were, were these gorgeously dressed and adorned women with pedicured hands and, and beautiful hair displayed in, in marvelous fashion. And the couple began to talk about, you know, what's going on here? What is all this about? And so the woman went and, and she talked to the ladies. She first talked to, to the woman that wore the doily. She said, well, it's not really a doily. It's called a covering. And I wear this because the Bible talks about 
submission to God and submission to my husband and, 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 and living simply. And so as an expression of my faith, I wear this. It's, it's a commitment that I have personally. But you know what, she said. Sally, that I was sitting next to in church, she has a different opinion. She, you know, she, she is really focused on this whole idea of being free in Christ and that, there, it, that we're no longer male or female or, or, or slave or free. And, 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 and she feels like that, that her covering is, is her hair and that her covering is her husband or, or her pastor. And, you know, she, she feels that way. And so that's, that's why she does what she does. And, and she, you know, she feels like she's really being faithful to God. And you know what? I respect that. So really here in our church, you can just do whichever one you like. You know, where are you with the Lord? Because what we're all about as a church is really following Jesus and encouraging everybody to do that in a way that feels authentic and honest and real and and faithful to them. And we try not to judge each other. We try to encourage one another. And so the woman talked to both of the ladies and she made her own decision. I'm not going to tell you what she decided, but she made her own decision in that context about what was the most faithful thing for her to do based on where she was with the Lord and, and, and what she needed to say to herself, what she needed to say to the church, what she needed to say to the world. And that small little Mennonite church that was just beginning actually became a nationwide network of churches that planted churches all over the country. And you know why? Do you know why? Chapter 14, verse 1. They accepted each other. They accepted each other And they didn't quarrel about disputable matters where, you know what, there's probably not just one answer. And they focused on the real one answer, that Jesus is our Lord. We're called to love our God and to love our neighbor faithfully and to live that out in faithful ways. I love that story. Because it's a good story. It's a really good story. And I believe it's a story that everyone in this room would like to live into. So how do we avoid divisions and spark growth? It's a good question. And if I'm consistent with what I've been saying, there's probably more than one answer. Right? But one answer that Paul gives is to stop judging and holding each other in contempt. To accept each other and to trust that each is doing their best to be faithful to Jesus. To ask ourselves what Paul asked the church in verses 10 through 12. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt You know what? We're all going to stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give account for ourselves to God. We need to remember that we will never be held accountable for anyone else's words or deeds, whether they are right or wrong. We will only be held accountable for our words and our deeds. So I would like to offer you some words that I think God might like all of us here today to say. I'll recite them for you, and after that I'm going to give you an opportunity to say them to your neighbor, maybe, if you like. It's a a confession, and let me say that I am saying these words to you from my heart as your pastor. 
And they're going to be up on the screen here. So as soon as they're there, we'll begin. I'm going to say these to you and then uh, give you an opportunity as well to say them. I realize that we disagree on some things of faith. But we both agree that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Because of that one thing, I accept you and I want you to be part of this church and I want you to be part of my life. I do not think of you as less of a person because we disagree on some things of faith or the church. I promise not to hold you in contempt or to judge you. I promise not to talk badly about you behind your back to others. I know that is a sin. And if I do that, I will need to give account for my own thoughts and words before God, not yours when I die. You are just as good a Christian as I am. God loves you just as much as he does me. You will have just as good a place in heaven as me. I want to join with you in a greater goal of showing God's love to the world and introducing them to Jesus. I want to do that with you. With God's help, I believe we can. Would you like to join me for lunch today so we can talk about that and how we can do that better? I'd like for you to think about someone that you might need or like to say that to as a way of entering into the scripture today. You're not going to be able to close your eyes because you're going to have to look at the screen. But think of a person. Maybe you even would want to turn to a person in this congregation and say this too. Maybe you're not ready. I know that sometimes words like this can be hard because of pain and hurt. So maybe you're not ready to say this. And if you're not, I would encourage you to tend to that as well to talk to that person or talk to an elder or a pastor. And try to tend to that hurt and pain so that you can be able to say things like this. Because this is, this is what Jesus invites us to do as followers of Jesus Christ. At least this is what I think Paul thinks it looks like. So those of you that are able and ready, that you might find healing and excitement and joy in saying this, I invite you now to repeat with me what is on the screen. And let's do it as a prayer and as a confession. For those that are ready, I realize we disagree on some things of faith, but we both agree that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Because of that one thing, I accept you. I want you to be part of this church and I want you to be part of my life. I do not think of you as less of a person because we disagree on some things of the faith or the church. I promise not to hold you in contempt or judge you. I promise not to talk badly about you behind your back to others. I know that is a sin And if I do that, I will need to give account for my own thoughts and words before God, not yours, when I die. You are just as good of a Christian as I am. God loves you just as much as he does me. You will have just as good a place in heaven as me. I want to join with you in a greater goal of showing God's love to the world and introducing them to Jesus. I want to do that with you. With God's help, I believe we can. Would you like to join me for lunch today 
so we can talk about how we can do that better. May it be, amen. Thank you, brother. May that be the way that we live in word and in deed.